Hey guys, welcome to Alt Swift X. Today we are discussing Raised by Wolves Season 2 Episode 6. And uh, my god, it was another eventful one. Um, we had a confrontation between mother and grandmother, the, the, the ancient necromancer and the newer necromancer. The, the the old wife and the new mistress of father. I think father secretly enjoyed having these uh, robot ladies fight over him. Um, and, and all these investigations into, you know, what is the nature and the purpose of grandmother, which is emerging as this really interesting mystery. Um, Sue reunites with Marcus after all this time um, and goes adventuring with Paul on a family outing to fulfill an ancient prophecy, uh, which results in Sue turning into a tree. Sue, 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 Sue is a tree now. Did not see this coming. <laughs> Of all the things that would happen with with the appearance of the Tree of Knowledge, um, I was not expecting Sue to turn into a tree. This is not how I anticipated her story ending. But I think not even that, like, on top of that, we had Tempest going off and birthing her baby. And doing so next to the Acid Sea, because Tempest planned to throw her newborn baby into the Acid Ocean to die. Um, but instead decided that she'd rather like to keep her baby, but then it was stolen from her by a mermaid. There was, it was, there was a mermaid that came from the, from the Bikini Bottom Orphanage Adoption Agency. It's a, it's like a squisher in A Song of Ice and Fire. This, this, this squishy little sea creature just comes and snatches her baby and takes it away. And, and I suppose, you know, Tempest will try and get her baby back. Um, God, that shot... I, I feel like Tempest should be looking at her baby in that particular shot. Um, but, so that was shocking. And the tree was shocking. And, and, and the necromancer stuff. And I mean, Sue's dead. I guess Sue's dead. I, I have a lot to say about Sue's story and Sue's arc here. Like, I'm not entirely satisfied with this ending for Sue. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and yeah, me, like, Hunter is building his own little robot project, like his father. Um, Holly has returned. We got to see, we got to see one of Carl's cousins. Remember, remember Carl, the robot who looked like this last season? Um, there's a lot to talk about, so let's get into it. Uh, thank you for the super chat from Cody, who says, Long live suit! Metamorphosis is strong in 22B. Alright, um... A bull in the live chat says the baby is acid proof, just like Sue in the last episode. Yeah, it is interesting that when the monster came from the acid ocean and grabbed Sue's baby, grabbed Tempest's baby, we saw that Tempest was burned by the acid. This acid that was like on the creature burned um, burn tempest, acid hisses. But the baby, who is also being exposed to the acid, doesn't seem to be hurt by the acid like Tempest was, so what's that about? I don't understand why Tempest would be hurt and the baby would not be hurt. Um, they are a little inconsistent with the acid, I suppose, but uh, yeah, maybe they'll have to, uh, they'll have to acknowledge that one way or another. Um, but yeah, let, let's go through it. Uh, Schubert in the live chat says that, who says that Sue's dead? Maybe she'll be back in seed pod form. Yeah, I mean, I, I like, I was interested to see, like, like once Sue turned into a tree, like, and Marcus approached it, I was like, oh my god, are we gonna see, like, Sue's face, like, grown into the tree? Is, is Sue's body gonna be, like, distorted and stretched, almost like a crucifixion? Like, are we gonna see some grisly... Cronenberg, like, enmeshment and mutated, you know, hybrid of, of Sue's flesh and the and the tree. Like, they could have done something really grisly if they wanted to. And they sort of have, what with the, the, the Sue meat that Marcus eats, and, like, that is Sue's flesh inside the tree that he eats, I suppose. Um, and, of course, all the, you know, the symbolism of that. Like, obviously, they're doing, like, a 
tree of knowledge, garden of Eden type thing? Like, what is the original sin here? What is the knowledge that they're going to gain from this tree? I'm very curious. Uh, thank you for the generous super chat from James, who says, Long time listener, first live stream. Love your work. Keep it up. So proud of you. Explain Stannis's banner sometime and the significance of the heart to R'hllor. Yeah, while well, his Baratheon identity has been subsumed and captured within his Reloric Melisandre magic identity, is what that's about, isn't it? Anyway, Raised by Wolves. So, we started the episode uh, with Sue uh, coming to get the seed pod um, in the Tarantula, because the seed pod is part of the Mithraic prophecy to grow the Tree of Knowledge, and Sue is hearing the voice of God in her head telling her to go fetch it. Uh, so she gets it from this charming robot here. I love the appearance and the performance and the whole vibe of these robots. It's so much fun. Um, I, I was kind of puzzled by, like, the, the robot is like, oh, can you turn off the lights because I, I don't like... I don't like the lights because... It distracts his senses, and so Sue's like, okay, I'll turn out the lights for you. Like, what was the point of that exchange? Why do we need to know that these robots don't like light? Maybe. I mean, Grandmother makes this bright, blinding light. Maybe Grandmother could use her light to, like, distract or disorient other robots, or maybe a character will use light to distract a robot. Maybe that's the reason why they had this little dialogue here, because I thought that was weird. Um, but I, li I like this place. Like, this is like an archive where the atheists are, like, cataloging artifacts that they find on this planet, specifically, like, the, 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 the Mithraic relics and stuff, which I quite like. Like, he's a little archivist. Like, they've got all these shelves with the little Dewey decimal number system on them, and, and, and I guess they're just, like, organizing and preserving these relics, which is, which is good. Like, I like that the, like, the atheists hate the Mithraic, but they are still, like, preserving and studying their relics and artifacts, seems to be what's going on here. So I, I like that, you know? I like the, um, respect to the importance of, you know, historical and religious artifacts. Um, but, you know, Sue has actually come to disable this guy and steal the seed pod. Now, I, I find it really interesting that Sue is, like, out here fulfilling the will of the voice in her head. Because, like, Sue has always been an atheist. Sue has been a pretty staunch atheist. She was fighting against the Mithraics all her life. Um, and she did start to question her faith when, like, Paul became her, like, surrogate child. And she sort of felt almost as though Paul was, like, a miracle from God. Uh, for her. Uh, that's at least what the actress said in season one. Um, but, you know, she really did sort of reject Mithraism. Like, she rejected Marcus being a prophet in season one, and, uh, you know, Paul shot her because of the voice in his head. Like, like, you know, she was very much an atheist, and, like, last episode she became, you know, she started hearing the voice of the entity in her head, the signal, the, the god soul, and she, she, like, accepted that that entity is real, but she rejected that it was God. She believed that there was, like, a technological scientific explanation for it. Um, but now, in this episode, she seems to be more genuinely, like, believing in this entity. Like, she still says a couple of times that, like, oh, you know, I believe that it's something sciencey. But she also says, like, praise Sol, and she, like, joins Marcus and Paul in fulfilling the prophecy. And, like, like it, I... It, it, it feels like Sue has undergone a pretty big transformation from an atheist to, like, a true believer. And I don't know if, like, there's been enough exploration of, like, how that's happened, you know? Like, I, I think obviously, like, a big part of the answer is that Sue craves having a family. She craves having Paul and Marcus in her life again. And religion is the path into that family because Paul and Marcus are such strong believers. So, it makes sense from that perspective, but, like, I don't even know why Sue is so keen to get back with Marcus. Because, like, remember last season, like, so much shit went down between Marcus and Sue. Like, at first, Marcus and Sue were just, like, pretending to be Mithraic. But then, you know, Marcus gradually became, like, a genuine, like, he genuinely believed that he was the prophet. And that created a lot of, like, tension between Marcus and Sue. Um, Marcus started going a bit crazy. He had these megalomaniacal speeches and, and Sue felt that he was endangering her and, like, she wanted 
to leave, but he wanted to stay, and, like, it, it escalated into conflict between Marcus and Sue. Like, Marcus pushed Paul, and, and Sue punched Marcus, and, 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 then, and then Marcus imprisoned Sue. Like, Marcus literally locked Sue in a in a thing because he she was trying to run away from his r r religious fanatical craziness and and that's why sue escaped him at the end of season one and, and took paul and, and got away from marcus marcus was a scary violent controlling emotionally manipulative asshole and so that's why i think it's dissatisfying that like in this episode it, it sort of treats it as a good thing that sue is back with her like abusive ex marcus and and she dies like having let go of like like embraced religion and embraced marcus and like i don't know if that's right for her you know so I almost hope that Sue will, like, come back in some sense. Like, yeah, maybe there will be a little, like, you know, clone of Sue or a baby of Sue or a new seed will grow from the tree and some, you know, Sue creature will return or something. Or maybe Sue is, like, now, like, part of the god of, of the spirit of Kepler-22b. Like, maybe Sue is is within the planet now. Her soul is subsumed inside the planet. Maybe she'll be a ghost like Tally. I, I don't know. There, there are possibilities. It wouldn't surprise me if Sue was gone for good, but I don't know. I personally didn't feel entirely satisfied by this ending for Sue's character. Like, I like her reconnecting with Paul. I don't so much like her reconnecting with Marcus, and I, I'm not entirely sold on her, like, religious conversion, you know? Uh, and thanks for the super chat from Princess Lioness. Um, yeah, so what are we saying in the live chat? Matt says that I think Sue felt that even though she figured out Sol may not be a god, but is very real and may be benevolent. Yeah, like maybe Sue doesn't have to believe that Sol is a god to still feel that it gives her purpose. Like she said a few times that maybe it's an alien, maybe it's a consciousness. And maybe that's like enough for her. You know, like, I, I think, was it, was it Paul or was it Marcus who said, what's the difference between a god and an alien, you know? Like, maybe even if something has a scientific explanation, maybe you can still have a kind of religious faith and, and belief in it. So, um, I think that makes sense. Um... Yeah, okay. Uh, Alexander says, Sue said that she would do anything for Sol. She needed Marcus for the seeds and to keep Paul happy. Yeah, I think Paul is a big part of this. And, like, the, yeah, the last thing she did was, like, singing the lullaby. Um, Lifeforms in the live chat says that she sings the lullaby that she didn't know in the last season. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 I remember that. There was that moment where... Uh, Marcus and Sue had to prove that they were Mithraic by singing this really well-known Mithraic lullaby, and Marcus and Sue didn't know it. And that was like, ooh, that was like a dramatic moment last season, wasn't it? All right, so Sue takes the seeds, uh, and Father brings Holly and Lucius back to the atheist camp after his success last episode. Um, and Lucius and Marcus have another argument where, you know, Lucius is all salty with Marcus because of the shit that went down last season, and Lucius wants Marcus dead, um, and he really wants Marcus to suffer, and yeah, like, it's fine, like, I, I feel like, I, I feel like we don't know Lucius as well as we know the other characters, and so this rivalry doesn't hit as hard as some of the other relationships, but I think it's fine. Uh, and Lucius finds those metal cards in Marcus's boot. And as we later see, these metal cards contain information um, about what this tree is going to do. Um, although it's still, like, we don't actually get to see what's on the card. Because, like, previously, um, we did get to see on the cards. We saw that there was those birthing prison things. Like, we got that vision of the ancient past. Uh, from these cards in episode 9. That's when we first saw uh, this stuff, which is, you know, like the ancient rituals that used to happen on this planet and, like, the androids being used to make snakes. Um, this time, like, Mother, like, looked at the card, but we didn't actually get to see it. Yeah, Lucius gives Mother the card. Um, and, you know, maybe the card reveals that, you know, the tree grows from humans and requires, like, human sacrifice. Um... And Mother learns that, but she learns that 
too late to prevent it. So I don't know what the point of even like having that card in this episode was if we don't get to see what's on the card and Mother doesn't get to act. Or maybe Mother learns something this episode that is going to play out next episode. Like maybe she learns stuff about the Tree of Knowledge and next episode she's going to be telling everyone, hey, by the way, uh, the tree is made out of Sue and Brains. Thanks for the super chat from Brennan who says... Check out the drawings on the habitat from season one. Lots of snakes, five-pointed stars, and one of two people at a tree with another person scratched out behind the tree. Something is warning them. Ah, you're saying that even back in season one, they were warning us that one person has to die um, for... I've actually got some of the drawings right here. Damn, that was fast, wasn't it? Um, Here are some of the drawings... Uh, I don't see the specific drawing that you're talking about. Because I think some of these drawings were just made by, like, the kids. Like, these are just some of, like, Campion and the siblings. But yeah, there's a snake there. Like, you know, it, there's definitely some legit warnings going on here. That snake looks like it's flying. This is all Season 1, Episode 7 stuff. Um, there's a pit. Is the snake coming out of something or going into something? So yeah, I'm sure if you like went through and looked at all the drawings, you'd find even more hints and stuff. Um, Alright, let's continue. So Lucius and Marcus find the card and we get this fun scene where Mother is like trying to train Campion to be a leader because she wants her son to be the ruler of the planet, to be the leader of this atheistic colony on Kepler-22b. And, and Campion does not take to leadership easily. Um, like mother says oh you need to be known you need to like be nice to everyone and Campion like very awkwardly and nervously like tells a dad joke because you know his role model is father so Campion does what father does with like goofy jokes and it it doesn't it doesn't land well Uh, this is what uh, I believe is called bombing in the uh, stand-up comedy community Um, so we've got a question like is Campion gonna be a good leader will Campion be a leader at all I mean, maybe that's going to be sort of his arc this season. Like, maybe he will learn to be a leader and to prove himself to this community. But maybe not. Maybe Campion isn't meant to be a great leader, and maybe he won't be successful, and maybe Paul will be the leader, or maybe Holly, or anyone. Um, I don't know. But yeah, I I like these sort of extras, you know? Like, while all this crazy shit has been going on, like, these are the people who have been, you know, picking food and trying to just survive on this planet and, you know, just hope they don't get blown up by one of these crazy robots. Um, I like seeing these guys' reactions. They have very little patience for Campion's nonsense. Um, Net in the live chat says, Why was only one human smart enough to read the card? Yeah, well, I don't know if Lucius did know what was on that card. Like, Lucius says the card is a warning, and we sort of knew that last season, but I I don't know if Lucius actually... Lucius said there is something on here you should see. So yeah, maybe Lucius can read the card. I mean, maybe you just need to, like, plug the card into a computer, and the computer can read it for you. Or maybe Lucius just saw the symbols on the card and saw that there were, like, symbols of a tree on the card, so he knew it was important. Um... So yeah, yeah, it's a bit unclear like what Lucius knows here and what Mother learns from the card here. That's all a bit weird. Um, Hugh says the idea of a kid leading all of these war vets is hilarious. Yeah, like that's how these guys must see Campion, right? Like yeah, these guys are the veterans of a horrific holy war back on Earth. Um, they've seen some shit, they've been through some shit. To them, Campion is just like this weird child who is like a native of this alien planet. He has no experience of Earth, he has no understanding of what they have been through. He has no idea what they need and want, and they don't understand him. So, I, it, it just, I, I like how they show us this. Like, it is very presumptive for Mother and Campion to be thinking about Campion leading the planet when Campion doesn't know who it is that he's gonna rule bit like Daenerys coming to Westeros and having no idea of who the Westerosi are and what the Westerosi want, you know? That's the thing about prophesied leaders and prophesied kings. Like, that doesn't... You, having a prophecy doesn't mean that you're necessarily qualified. Um, we find that Hunter has started a robot project of his own. Just like Father, he has decided to build his own robot. 
And he's saying that, well, you know, maybe he'll want to set up somewhere else, go out on his own. And I like that because, like, you know, Hunter in season one was, was you know, kind of a um, privileged Mithraic upper class dude. And, she, and he was faithful with the Mithraic and he, um, you know, compared to the other kids, sort of stayed faithful. But he sort of questioned that faith now after all everything that's gone down. And I like how his reaction is like, well, maybe I need to be independent. You know, maybe I don't need to be part of this community. Maybe I can do my own thing. I like that impulse. It's a bit different to what the others are doing. And I like that he builds his own little robot. I wonder if this is based off like, you know, scrap parts from the robot Thunderdome and all of that sort of um, atheist uh, community that we saw earlier. Uh, I'm interested to see what kind of robot he builds. I don't know if this is going to be a a human-like robot or if this is just going to be a little sort of Carl thing or if it's going to be unsuccessful. Who knows? But I like that Hunter's sort of doing his own thing. Like, I like when they touch base with some of these secondary characters. Um, and instead of just being accessories to the main plot, they have their own sort of goals and personalities. And um, I enjoy this. Lauren in the live chat says, getting vibes between Hunter and Tempest. Yeah, I mean, they've been confiding in each other lately. I don't know if it's, like, romantic necessarily, but, um, yeah. I, I, w- I wonder if Hunter could almost be, like, a father figure to Tempest's baby, if it is that Tempest gets her baby back and decides to be a mother to it. Maybe they could form their own little family. I don't know. Uh, but I like, I like seeing, like, growth and change from Hunter has been cool. Um, can't be kids forever, Hunter says. And I like, uh, yeah, I like, you know, this is all about growing up and, you know, when kids grow up, they start doing their own thing and leave the nest and, yeah, and and mother is, has mixed feelings about that like any parent does. So, yeah, I enjoy all of this. Vita uh, sings this little Mithraic lullaby, which sort of foreshadows Sue singing the lullaby and opening the seed box later. And of course, you know, the fact that it is a, you know, Mithraic lullaby that opens the box, you know, it shows that this ancient scripture of the Mithraic and the culture of the Mithraic and the songs of the Mithraic are all deeply intertwined with the, you know, mechanics of this prophecy and technology on Kepler 22b. Um, and they say this episode, you know, oh, the scripture, this is where the scriptures were written. You know, Kepler 22b is the source of the Mithraic religion. Um, and they sort of say that, oh, you know, the religion isn't real on earth, but here the God is here. And this is what, this is what the Mithraic religion is all about, uh, which is sort of what we had already, you know, uh, guessed was what was going on here. Um, Kepler 22b is the source of the myth of the Mithraic religion and of the Mithraic technology, like the necromancers. You know, like grandmother looks like she's one of the more sort of original necromancers compared to the sort of later necromancers built on Earth, which is like you know a, a copy. I wonder if grandmother is more powerful than mother. You know, at being sort of the original uh, made on the home planet. Um, I'm interested to see where that goes. Um, And so Tempest is pregnant and Sue declares that she's going to be pregnant really soon. It's interesting that, you know, we we hear that the the baby has changed, Sue says. How has the baby changed? Because I think we've got to be suspicious of any kind of, of childbirth in this show because, you know, mother thought she was birthing a human. Uh, she birthed a snake. Um, you know, we were talking about the mystery of, like, why is it that this baby, uh, Tempest's baby, why is it not hurt by the acid? The acid that hurts Tempest does not hurt the baby. Maybe that's related to the change that the baby undergoes. Um, maybe this baby is not entirely human, but is something else. In the same way that mother's serpent baby is, like, part technological, part biological. Maybe this planet alters the DNA of, um, of things that are born here. Um, Julian in the live chat says, grandmother calls her weapon. I think grandmother and father are meant to be caregivers for humans. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Because, yeah, in this confrontation, grandmother calls mother a weapon, which she is. Like, mother was created as a weapon necromancer on Earth. Grandmother, it seems, has a different purpose. I mean, it's really interesting when father sort of, you know, mother and father study grandmother and try and figure out what her purpose is. Um, And father observes that instead of a weapons system, uh, there's something else installed in grandmother. Some other function is in grandmother. 
Um, so yeah, as you say, maybe it's about raising humans. But I mean, I just keep thinking back, like the, the, the big sort of one of the big revelations about the mysteries of this planet last season was that androids were used on this planet as part of some weird religious ritual to birth serpents through this tube thing. So I, I I tend to think that grandmother's purpose is related to this serpent birthing Mishigos that we saw last season. Um, and, you know, it makes me curious about the veil as well, because there's a lot of talk about the the veil, that is, the, the call that is over grandmother's face. I wonder what that is related to. I mean, also, like, you know, like, mother said, um, close your eyes, Campion. Close your eyes, Campion, she says. Um, because the necromancer weapons, and I'm still not super clear on exactly how this works, but the necromancer weapons can hurt you if you see them. So you've got to like, it's a lot, it's like Medusa or something. You can't look at a necromancer's face while she is weaponized with her weapon eyes. Um, and I wonder if, if the call, if the face covering is about protection from like the necromancer powers, you know, closing your eyes, using a veil... Um, and of course, you know, a veil is, is, a, is a very religious piece of headwear in a lot of cultures and spaces and like it, it might have symbolic uh, meaning in terms of like, you know, covering your eyes, being blinded by faith or something like that. There's all sorts of potential uh, meanings. Um, Hugh in the live chat says, grandmother is basically a genetic engineer. Yeah. Uh, Matt in the live chat says, Botanotech. Yeah, so that was a really sort of weird <laughs> uh, exchange that happened here. Um, where was it? So, like, Father and Campion were talking about Grandmother. Where was that moment? And, the, the, you know, Father was talking about how he created Grandmother by, like, growing her. Um, and... Campion was like, oh, that's so exciting that you, like, grew this android because maybe you'll be able to uh, grow other things. Yeah. Father says it's Botanitech. Uh, it grows like an organic plant. And Campion is like, oh, we could also grow cities and ships and giant androids. And mother and father are like, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that, that's totally what we could do with this. Um, this could give us hope and stuff, they say. Uh... Which is weird to me. Like they, they, like they grew a grandmother robot from like the ancient corpse of a grandmother robot. How does that mean they'll be able to build cities and ships and giant androids? Like, I, I that seems like a weird leap. But I, I, I guess that I guess that will be a thing. I guess that's why they're saying it. Um, and cities, of course, is relevant because there was talk, especially last season, of like having a a sit like a, a city being built by the prophesied one. Um, in season one, episode three, we saw Paul like building these cities. And again, in season one, episode seven, like it seems to be part of the prophecy of, of the Mithraic that the chosen one will build like a city paradise. Um, so this idea of using Botanitech to grow a city, uh, there's probably something in that, huh? Especially when we just saw this tree grow. Like if this tree can grow, maybe a city can grow as well. Uh, I mean, this tree had, like, brains in it, you know? So I guess there is something to this Botanitech. Um, but in this case, the Botanitech, it runs on blood, you know? Like, there is human sacrifice and human blood required to grow this tree. So will there be, you know, blood and human sacrifice to grow uh, cities and ships and giant androids? I mean, I guess Grandmother just required fuel blood. But that is a sort of bloody sacrifice in and, in and of itself. It reminds me of the old gods in A Song of Ice and Fire. Because the old gods take blood sacrifice and human sacrifice. Um, and they also are like a hive mind of the spirits of the dead. In the same way that this tree has like sucked in the spirit of Sue. And of course with the tree thing, like Campion said last season, that he believes that trees have souls in season one. Uh, have I got a clip of that? Yeah. Yeah, Campion in season one, episode six, said that maybe even trees have souls. Look how young he is in season one. <laughs> Um, and so I guess he was right, you know, because like this tree certainly has a soul. Like Marcus comes up and touches it and like f sees, like, like, look at this, like sees the, 
life essence like moving through the tree you know like like sue's soul is in this tree i think so marcus is correct and that just sort of makes you wonder like what what else has a soul on this planet like are all of the trees on this planet grown from human souls and human sacrifice you know like, and you know tally's ghost was out there before and like mouse came back like maybe this this planet maybe the life on this planet is grown from like human souls and human blood which of course ties in totally to the series themes about uh life coming from death and sacrifice is what causes causes life and stuff like that so all very interesting um julian in the live chat says that this whole planet is just rogue ai eco nanobots gone wrong yeah i mean maybe it's like a terraforming thing like maybe the ancient humans needed to transform kepler 22b into a habitable world and like this is their technology like this is how they create trees this is how they create food this is how they do it they they have this technology that generates life and maybe the serpents are like part of that process that sort of went wrong and went a bit haywire i mean i'm getting increasingly confused about what the goal of god is on this planet what is the goal of the entity of the signal because in season one it seemed pretty clear that the goal of the entity was to birth snakes and that seems to have been the ancient purpose for a while but like the the entity or the voice assuming that it's the same voice and i think it's possible that there are actually two different voices of two different gods but, like, there was a voice that guided Sue to become this tree. And so, you know, the Mithraic prophecy um, being fulfilled is, like, one of the goals here. Um, and, like, I, I, why does the god want trees? Why, why does... Like, it's not just about the snakes, it seems to me. So, all very mysterious. Um, Last Looks says, how could there be ancient humans unless time travel is involved? Yeah, some people have talked about time travel. I don't, I don't, I don't think we're going to do time travel in this show. I, I think what it is, is, is a cycle. Like, I think that humans probably originated on Kepler-22b, um, and then the snakes uh, started taking over Kepler-22b, uh, and the Mithraic religion originated on Kepler 22b, probably originated by the Soul God, which I think probably is a rogue AI computer at the core of the planet. And so basically, Kepler 22b started turning into a absolute um, snakes on a plane nightmare. So the ancient humans, some of them escaped and like seeded Earth. So I think that humans came to Earth from Kepler 22b, um, and they carried with them the Mithraic religion, or maybe the Mithraic religion was sent to them as a signal from Kepler 22b, like maybe the rogue AI sent uh, like radio signals to Earth and like that's how it gave the Mithraic religion to humanity. Um, and that has lured humanity back to Kepler 22b and sort of r restarting the cycle of um, civilization, human civilization on Kepler 22b. Um, I mean, I guess if you're trying to be realistic about it, like, it's pretty hard to explain, like, evidence of human evolution on Earth if humans came from Kepler-22b. So maybe humans originally, originally, originally came from Earth, and then they went to Kepler-22b, and then they created the Mithraic religion, and then the snakes happened, and then they went back to Earth. And so they've just been bouncing back and forth between Earth and Kepler-22b for who knows how long. Th that is sort of my best guess at what's going on here but um i i don't know um i am in the live chat says that there has to be at least two gods because the voice from season one can't get through to the tropical zone because of the electromagnetic interference yeah uh, the multiple gods are at war with each other and the humans are the pawns yeah i, I think that's a good interpretation i mean i thought that the trust uh the atheist uh, AI god was going to be like the other god in this story but the trust has seemingly been destroyed um by mother so uh, you know if there is a second god and I agree that there might be one what is it where is it what does it look like like I'm pretty comfortable with the idea of the fiery planet core being soul but like where and what the fuck is this second god and how are its goals different um 
I, I think it's possible that it might turn out that the trust is actually still alive and the trust is this other voice. Uh, but yeah, it's really hard to, di to distangle like what the different goals are here. Mrs. T in the live chat says, so eventually we will go back to Earth. I think that would make sense. Like I would almost see that as like a uh, series finale, having some of these humans get back to Earth. I think that's a pretty likely thing to happen. Uh, depending, of course, on how many seasons they get and, you know, what the budgetary constraints and stuff are. Um, yeah. All right. Let's continue. Uh, JMO says, maybe the snake and the mermaids are from different gods. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I mean, I, I think that the snake god, soul god, doesn't like humans, and the snake god, soul god... Uh, caused humans to devolve into the creatures. I mean, we saw last episode that the Mithraic Relic Tooth changed a human creature into a devolved creature, animal creature. Um, so yeah, I think we can be confident that like, yeah, the 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 soul god doesn't like humans and, and wants to turn them into animalistic creatures. Um, although that said, like, why did the god lure humans back to Kepler-22b if it didn't want humans? And aren't humans, like, part of the life cycle, birthing cycle that the god uses to birth snakes? That sort of is what I thought was happening. Or maybe that is only using androids. Not sure. Um, Isaac in the live chat says that grandmother is the opposite of mother. Atheist versus religious. Weapon versus healer. Necromancer versus cleric. Yeah, I, I think grandmother is definitely like a foil to mother and an opposite of mother and a rival to mother. Um, I mean, mother sort of damaged grandmother here. So uh, this might be a uh, challenging relationship between these two, for sure. Um, let's continue. So Hunter's building his own little robot. Uh, Tempest's baby is changing and is going to be born soon. And Tempest is very stressed about that because she doesn't want this baby because uh, its father, Otho, raped her. And she was hoping to give this baby up for adoption. But then the people who are going to adopt it ran off. So, like, she doesn't know what the plan is and she's really scared. Um... And, you know, mother evokes this idea that, well, you know, you might not want the baby now, but once you see it, once you hold it, you will love it and you will want to keep it. So I was really interested, like, as Tempest started giving birth, I was really interested in, like, you know, are they going to do this sort of conventional thing where, you know, the, the, the mother's instinct conquers all and once she's holding the baby, like, it just imprints and it's just this, like, instinctual emotional thing where, you know, she will keep the baby no matter what. Um, like, that's, that, that is, like, you know, an obvious, understandable sort of thing to do. Um, but, you know, Raised by Wolves is so much about uh, questioning and changing and subverting, like, the our assumptions and, like, the traditional ideas and archetypes about motherhood, you know? Like, it's this is, this is a show about surrogate parents and adoption. This is a show about... Uh, robots raising humans and animals raising humans and this is a show about unusual family arrangements and like th this is so like it, it makes perfect sense to me that in such a show Tempest might give up her baby you know because this show is so interested in exploring um altering and and rearranging those like um family bonds that we assume to be conventional um so I, I was like, I was interested to see wh where that would go. I, I thought it would be interesting if Tempest did reject her baby. I, I did not want to see the baby burn up in the acid ocean. That, I, oof, I did not want to see that. But I was a bit scared that it was going to happen. So like, I thought it was a very effective scene. Um, and so yeah, in the end, like they did do this thing where Tempest sort of appears to decide that like, yeah, she does want her baby after all. The mother's instinct conquered her previous desires but then the baby was taken by the sea monster <laughs> um and as uh, as someone in the live chat pointed out the monster has multiple breasts on its body uh please don't demonetize me youtube um and uh you know I'll, I'll show you on the on the next episode so you know mild spoilers for the next 30 seconds if you don't want to see the preview of the next episode but on the next episode thing, um, we see that 
this sea monster has started breastfeeding and, and nurturing and caring for Tempest's human baby. And I suppose what's happening is that, you know, Tempest tries to get her baby back. Um, but, you know, this is a very... This is a very intriguing image, and this is, you know, certainly in keeping with the themes of the show in terms of just doing weird parenthood, birth, life, you know, adoption, surrogacy. You know, this is raised by wolves, Romulus and Remus, human babies raised by a wolf. Now we've got a human baby raised by a fucking shape of water squisher. So, like, I'm intrigued to see where this goes. Um, I guess the obvious thing would be for the humans to just kill this sea creature and take Tempest's baby back and she raises it as a human but maybe something more weird and interesting will happen like maybe the baby will be imprinted onto this sea creature and the baby will embrace its sea creature mother and maybe it will have genes that allow it to withstand the acid and maybe you know like in the same way that we saw Paul had those serpent eyes and became like a serpent baby a uh, serpent person, maybe this baby will become like a mermaid baby, you know? Maybe this baby will become a creature like the sea monsters. I'm not sure what the moral of that story would be. I'm not sure what, how Tempest would feel about that. Like, bleh. but that's exactly the sort of crazy shit this show might do. So, very interested to see where that goes. Uh, Daniel Wilson says, caustic breast milk. Yeah, I mean, is that milk? Like, is a acid ocean mermaid capable of producing milk that can be consumed by a human baby Oof. raised by a merman he says yeah there's a lot of uh questions here daniel in the live chat says that maybe uh the baby was unharmed by the acid because it was altered by grandmother's dark photons that's an interesting theory because grandmother did emerge around the time that tempest's baby changed and maybe that's part of maybe that's part of grandmother's mysterious purpose you know like mother and father were saying that what what is this extra function that grandmother has like what it what is going on here maybe the purpose of grandmother is to like alter and engineer and edit life forms to make them suit the planet like like maybe this is not about terraforming kepler 22b to make it suitable for humans maybe this is about altering humans to suit the planet and maybe that's what the serpents are like the serpents are adapted to this planet like there are all these pits on the planet so that so the snakes are able to fly into the pits and you know the the serpents are able to eat the fruit on these planets and like the moss on the mountaintops like like the serpents are an organism that that can survive in this habitat so maybe the serpents, you know, they maybe the serpents are like a mixture of like human and android and snake. Maybe the maybe hum, serpents are not a replacement of humans. Maybe the serpents are an evolution of humans. I mean, that's kind of what we were told in season one. Like the sort of digital god Campion Sturges said to Mother um, that this baby inside you, it is the future of humanity. Um, and it was therefore sort of lying to mother in a way it was it was misleading her but like maybe Sturges was sort of telling the truth in a way like maybe this serpent baby that mother birthed is the sort of logical next step for the survival of life on this planet you know um maybe he wasn't wrong uh daniel in the live chat says ain't this baby juiced with uh HG, it will be six foot tall by the end of next episode. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't... Say, yeah, I mean, maybe this baby will grow really fast. Um, maybe it will become something really quickly. Because, like, do we really want... Like, do the showrunners really want to have to deal with a baby for seasons and seasons? Like, are we really going to want an infant and then a toddler, you know, growing up? Like, are we going to do time skips? Like, or is this baby going to stay a baby? Uh, you know, some... Like, like the sort of animatronic baby prop that they had was like not super great in like it's its movements were pretty uncanny uh I, I thought pretty creepy do they really want this little animatronic baby doll for the rest of the season or will this baby rapidly grow into some kind of fucking sea creature baby yeah i don't know um nicholas in the live chat says uh, Alt, if you can, could you skip to a front view of Grandmother? I think it's a clue of how wide Grandmother's hips are. 
Uh, she may have something to do with birth for humans in general. Okay, let's have a look at grandmother's uh, childbearing hips. Uh, how's how's this? Uh, we can zoom in a bit. Do they do they look like especially broad childbearing hips? I don't know. Not 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 especially. I don't think. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if grandmother will be birthing because like because like the weird thing about like the serpent birth stuff is that the androids birth snakes through their mouth, not through the reproductive organs. Um, but, you know, like, father and mother identify that, you know, grandmother has some extra piece of technology inside of her, something else in her anatomy, some other function. Maybe that anatomy is a uterus. Maybe grandmother has a robot uterus, and maybe that's what makes her special. Um, thanks for the donation from David, who says, I really appreciate your positive approach towards the show. Helped me look past some initial problems. Many TV movie podcasts are very critical and lead me to think about all the mistakes. You make me excited for the next episodes. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, I mean, I it's funny. I, I've gotten comments uh, as well from people saying, oh, Alt Shift X, you're too critical of Raised by Wolves. Um, so if I'm getting people telling me I'm too critical and too nice, then maybe I've got the happy medium. I don't know. I, I think I often am really critical of stuff that I like, because that's just how I engage with stuff that I like sometimes. Um, but yeah, I really like this show. I think there's a lot of things that are silly about it, and there are some things that don't work, but there's a lot that I love about it as well. Um, all right. What else is happening in the live chat? Lauren in the live chat says, the function they can't figure out could be what gives her the power to mess with baby DNA. Yeah, maybe it's like a genetic alteration dark photon thing. Cobra says, maybe mother is actually Lilith, a weapon, and grandmother is actually Eve, the mother of all humanity. Maybe. Uh, Dawn says, <laughs> yeah, imagine measuring hips to decide who to cast. Uh, all right, let's continue. So, uh, we've got this extra telling mother that uh, father has returned with Marcus captive, and Sue is like, oh, I'm going to see my ex again. That's going to be weird. Um, and so Marcus returns, and it's this great confrontation of, you know, the great enemy of the atheists has been defeated and captured at last, and then Paul runs in and just hugs him. So, you know, it's interesting that after... All of this, you know, Paul still has so much loyalty to Marcus. And partly that's because of the shared belief in Mithraism and, and in Sol. Uh, whereas Mother is very hostile to Marcus because of all of his, you know, terrorism and murders and his ideological differences. Um, and, you know, Marcus is cynical and unsurprised when he finds out that Mother has declared herself the dictator of this planet. Uh, Marcus is not a big fan of Mother and not a big fan of necromancers in general because he fought them in the war for ages. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, Mother demands that Marcus renounce his religion. Uh, so, you know, this is a real ideological battle. Like, Mother is trying to... It's not just about, like, protecting the lives of these people. She wants to uh, preserve her ideology and crush Marcus's religious ideology. Because, um, again, like, you know, part of Mother's function is to build an explicitly atheist society, a rejection of religion. Um, so she tries to make someone denounce their religion, which which is something that has a long history in the real world, forcing people to publicly renounce their religion. Uh, and Marcus basically refuses to, you know. He has this sort of humility, but he says that, you know, everyone is deserving of love's God, uh, of God's love, so... So, you know, Paul, you know, is happy with that, and that sort of, like, reinforces their religious bond. Um, and Lucius complains that he wanted to kill Marcus, and Mother didn't let him. I wonder, like, I wonder what's going to happen with Lucius this season. Um, because there's got to be some, like, final confrontation between Marcus and Lucius. Maybe Marcus will kill Lucius this season, because I don't expect Marcus to die this season. Um, he could. He could. Uh, I mean, I could imagine Marcus getting killed and then maybe even a time skip or something and then, like, Paul emerges as the new sort of Mithraic leader. Because Marcus has sort of been a loose end for a while. 
like the whole thing was that you know marcus was sort of the chosen one in season one but then the voice of soul stopped speaking to marcus and started speaking to paul instead so you know i sort of got the impression that mark you know god was done with marcus marcus doesn't have a role in the destiny of the planet anymore um so maybe lucius could kill marcus i don't know um so lucius is kind of pissed and i you know i could imagine him doing something dramatic in the next couple of episodes like he he is not satisfied with mother he's not loyal to mother he might do something drastic to try and kill father <laughs> to try and kill marcus and father is all uh, we'll get back to this um and so holly is back after her horrifying skynet experience where the faceless robot vril murdered a bunch of people in front of her and I wonder what impact that's going to ha have on Holly and, like, what her vibe is going to be. And I like that, I like that uh, Vita is the, um, is the one person with some emotional intelligence and telling everyone to leave Holly alone. <laughs> I like Vril being the voice of reason here and, and you know. I, I wonder what Vril's thing is going to be in the future. I mean, you know, th th there are characters here who are, like, kind of too young to really have much of a purpose in the story. Like, I wonder if maybe there will be, like, a time skip where they recast these child characters into adult characters later on. I think that would make sense and would be really interesting if they do that. Uh, Lifeform in the live chat says, where do you find that trailer? Um, on HBO Max after the episode... They have the, um, on the next episode, it, it plays after the episode. And they also have this after show feature where there's like behind the scenes cast and, and creator interviews. So that's on HBO Max where the show is. Maybe it's region locked. Maybe you can only see that in certain regions or something. I don't know. Some bullshit. Um, Unbound says maybe they need to restructure the budget. Maybe they need characters to die and set things up differently. Yeah, maybe. Um, all right. So Holly's back and uh, Sue is, is initially like, yeah, like Marcus should stay locked up. Like, I'm not a fan of Marcus. Um, but but Mother also says, I need to protect the lives of all, of everyone in this community, not just Paul. And I think that sort of alienates Sue because Sue obviously cares about Paul more than she cares about the other children. And I think this might sort of be the moment where Sue's like, okay, like I will run off with Marcus and Paul instead of Mother um, because, you know, my priority is Paul and Mother's priorities are different. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting point that Paul makes here that like, you know, the bio bomb that cocooned Paul um, and killed another Mithraic guy didn't affect Marcus. Why wasn't Marcus affected by the biobomb from the Trust? Um, and I wonder if this is related to, you know, the biobomb was turning Paul into a serpent person. And I, I feel that that's probably not the usual function of this bioweapon. So maybe, like, for the same reason that the weapon turned started turning Paul into a snake... Uh, maybe it also protected Marcus, you know, because, because it was planning to use Paul and Marcus for some mysterious reason, um, you know, to fulfill the prophecy of Mithraism or whatever. Um, so Werner says a super mega war for paradise would be too expensive to film. Yeah, I, I agree. That's sort of what concerns me because, like, I, you know, th this is a story about Genesis and about new civilization and about wars. And, like, you could imagine this becoming a very epic, large scale, expensive production, but it doesn't look like they're going to have the budget to do that. So I, I imagine it will be a very challenging uh, job to try and, like, plan this and to budget this in a way to give it that sort of epic religious scale later on uh within you know the constraints that they have um and so and so campion says that like you know campion last episode was saved by the glowing form of grandmother um and so for a moment like campion kind of does embrace the mithraic religion soul saved my life campion says um, but then later on, when Campion witnesses grandmother, um, he sort of realizes that, oh, like, it, it actually wasn't, um, 
yeah, here it is. It wasn't Sol, Campion says. So, like, in, in the space of 10 minutes... No, in the space of four minutes, Paul goes from, Oh, Sol saved my life. Maybe I believe in God after all. To, oh, it wasn't Sol. Yeah, no, God's not real after all, Campion goes. Uh, which, you know, I don't know. I, I guess that's... Like, he's, he's you know... He, he's changing his religious beliefs depending on his experiences. I, I guess that makes sense. Uh, but Paul continues to be... Uh, sorry, Campion continues to be this sort of agnostic, you know, somewhere in between believing in God and not. He has more of a general spiritual sense of the souls in all things. And I, I still see him as a mediator between the atheists and the Mithraic. Like, I think he has a healthy middle ground sort of an opinion. Um... Let's continue. So Paul sort of convinces Campion to help him free Marcus and fulfill the prophecy. Um, and Campion agrees. Uh, and uh, we see that the atheists are continuing their sort of dystopian, shitty, like, inst instructions from robots. But I guess now it's Mother who's in charge of this, like, job marble system. So Mother has not dramatically changed the way things work in the atheist colony. I, I wonder how much the atheists are going to put up with this shit. Like, they did not sign up to be ruled by a necromancer, you know? Um, and I wonder if Cleaver, the, the previous sort of mediary of the trust, might have a role to sort of return. And Campion continues to sort of awkwardly, like, try to connect with the atheist people. And I don't think he's uh, terribly successful. Um... And so Campion tries to convince Mother to release Marcus and basically fails. Um, then Campion comes in and meets Grandmother, as we've discussed. Um, and, yeah, like, I, I do think it's silly, like, as Father says, I think it's silly that Campion has so quickly, like, forgiven Marcus and wants to help free Marcus. Because, like, Marcus did orchestrate the graphic murder of Father and capture of Mother last season. Um, Campion was hostile to Marcus last season when Marcus tried to manipulate him. Um, I think Campion has a lot of good reasons to be suspicious of Marcus and not want to free him. Um, but in this episode, he's pretty, he, he's pretty quick to embrace Marcus on behalf of Paul, which you know, also seems kind of unnecessary because it's like, it's like Sue and Paul who save Marcus anyway. So I don't know, you know, I don't know if that had a purpose, um, but it's really cool to see grandmother. And it's interesting to see that Campion is the one who connects with grandmother, like grandmother reacts to Campion in a way that um, she did not connect with father, maybe because Campion is human, you know, whereas father is just an android. Um, and she's speaking ancient Mithraic, because of course she's an ancient necromancer, like she is, that, that is her thing on this planet. Uh, she is part of the history of this planet, uh, and she activates into like a necromancer, and I love like the different design of this necromancer. Um, like this looks like a very sort of old sort of like aesthetic style with like the patterns that are on her body, like it, it, it looks... Um, like a low-tech sort of a design, and yet she is a hyper-sophisticated necromancer robot powered by dark photon energy. Like, it sort of raises the question, like, the ancient humans on this planet, like, were they technologically sophisticated? Did they have computers and spaceships? And, I mean, they had robots. Like, I guess they must have been technologically advanced in that sense. But, I mean, then again, like, like you know, grandmother was grown, you know, this idea of biotech um technology so you know maybe maybe the ancient humans were not you know they didn't have factories and computers they had like organic technology that could be cool um all right so campion gets to meet grandmother and he sort of changes his mind about god <laughs> Uh, and then mother interrupts and i i, I love this performance because like you know what what this feels like is that mother, who sort of was or is officially father's partner, walks in on father hanging out with this other woman. You know, it has the feeling of someone being caught cheating or like, you know, she is like the wife meeting the mistress, you know. And so they have this sort of emotional confrontation, which feels like, you know, a, a fight over father, uh, which I, I thought was fun. Um, and yeah, I mean, Mother is also very sort of, it makes sense for her to be 
uh, suspicious of this necromancer thing because this could be uh, more powerful than her. This could be the most powerful force on the planet, potentially. Uh, and it's an unknown. So I enjoy this confrontation and it looks really cool. And Mother is uh, quite pleased to have won this battle, I think. Um, and so we discussed the sort of biotech growing stuff. Um, and Mother is still frustrated uh, about trying to make Campion an atheistic leader, and Mother translates Grandmother's uh, words to mean "Why are you not wearing your veil?" So I think Grandmother is confused. Like she's on. Like Grandmother sort of thinks that she's still in the ancient times, uh, and she thinks that everyone is, you know, participating in the ancient rituals and the ancient purposes, whatever they may be, with the, with the veil. And I thought it was really interesting when Grandmother later talks to Father. And says, like, you know, um, grandmother, grandmother asks about who is my partner. Grandmother says, I am your partner, father. And father says, oh, uh, no, I'm not your partner. I, I'm mother's partner. Um, which seems to be a terrible mistake, I think. Like, grandmother thinking that father is her partner might have made father safe, you know? Um, like, I think grandmother thought that she was going to work with father. Um, but father says that, oh, no, mother is my partner. Which also has the double meaning of, like, their relationship, you know? Like, father has an intimate relationship with mother. Um, and he's sort of a little bit flustered when this new woman says that declares that she is his partner. And so I like, you know, it has, like, an emotional uh, vibe to it as well as the sci-fi vibe. Uh, James in the live chat says, father is the original father. Yeah, I mean, maybe the reason why grandmother recognizes father and thinks that father is her partner, maybe father is, like, in some way a descendant of or a copy of, or maybe he really is the original. Like, maybe father has been around for thousands of years, uh, and he had some role on this ancient planet. I'm not sure how, because, like, Campion Sturges sent father from Earth to Kepler-22b, um, but it is very mysterious that grandmother seems to recognize father as having a certain purpose. I mean, maybe that's just because, you know, father is the first person that grandmother saw when she was reborn. So maybe she just sort of like imprinted on him and sort of assumed that he was the person who knew what was going on. I don't know. Uh, Lord Cycle says, is father falling in love with grandmother? I mean, the series creator in the after show says that like, yeah, father is sort of enamored with grandmother. Like, I think that father does have a sort of a crush on grandmother in some sense. So it is like a fun love triangle between father and mother and grandmother, uh, which when you say it out loud sounds kind of wrong, doesn't it? Uh, but, you know, father says, oh, you know, oh, no, I'm not your partner. Um, and then grandmother asks how many humans are on this planet. And father says a few hundred with another on the way. And then grandmother reacts and this like red, <laughs> this red digital screen comes up and stuff. So I think father might have fucked up here. Like, Grandmother is very interested in the humans on this planet, so I wonder if Grandmother is going to use the humans on this planet for some scary, sneaky breeding purpose, religious purpose, or something. Uh, I think Father might have fucked up here, um, and I think that Grandmother might, uh, might be a danger to the humans. Uh, and, you know, how that's going to connect to, like, the trees and the fruit and the knowledge is... Um, a mystery to me. Uh, Mrs. T says, Ms. T says, father seems to be very proud of grandmother. Yeah, I mean, he is proud of grandmother because he built grandmother in the same way that mother created life with the serpent. So um, it's definitely an important relationship for him. Um, Ms. T says, what is in father's makeup? What makes him different to mother's eyes? Uh, and to grandmother. I mean, while father is a is a humble uh, service model, generic service model, something, something, they called him before. Um, and that's always one of the sort of defining, interesting dynamics of his relationship with mother is that mother is this ultra powerful necromancer weapon, whereas father is a, is a robot with less powers and less capabilities. Um, and so he sort of had this... Um, feeling of inadequacy last season where he felt like he wasn't able to do as much and he felt like he wasn't appreciated as much and so like having a, a relationship with you know grandmother and you know with the kids like people who appreciate him are very important to him 
and you know he felt very proud when he fought in the Thunderdome last last episode. So I think that's part of what's going on with Father emotionally. Uh, Marcus says, I don't think that grandmother, Marcus in the live chat, says, I don't think grandmother approves of a human colony on her planet. Yeah. I mean, I hope that grandmother isn't going to try and, like, exterminate the humans or anything, but I think it might be something more complicated. Um, So, you know, mother defeats grandmother, uh, knocks her out for now, and Sue comes to Marcus. Marcus is a prisoner of the atheists, uh, and this is when this, <laughs> and I do enjoy, like, like Sue punches Marcus, um, and then Marcus says, I know that punch, and he recognizes Sue from being punched in the face by Sue, uh, and that's when Sue reveals herself. So I think that, I think that's funny that that's, like, the dynamic of Marcus and Sue's relationship, like, Sue has apparently punched Marcus in the face so much that, uh, he recognizes her punch, which, again, just tells you that this relationship is a really fucked up relationship, and, again, makes me feel like, why is Sue coming back to him? You know, and like the answer partly is God, because, you know, Sue heard the voice of God and the voice of God told her how to save Paul. And, you know, Paul and and Sue still sort of says, you know, like he's a signal, like she says that this is not like a God God. This is more of a technological artifact. It's a transmission coming from somewhere on the planet. But like, you know, she also talks about soul being a God later on. She says, praise soul, and she tries to fulfill the prophecy. So, you know. It's about it. It is about some kind of real religious belief with Sue to some extent, or a kind of faith, uh, and it's about reconnecting with Paul and Marcus, and that's why she comes back to Marcus and and frees him and comes to fulfill the prophecy, which is interesting. Um, and you know she does say some interesting things about like you know that it's a transmission coming from somewhere on this planet. So is that the planet core or is that something else? Uh, And she says that, you know, this is where the scriptures were written, you know, Kepler-22b is where the religion originated, is where the technology originated. Um, Back on Earth, Sol was just a story, but here on Kepler-22b, he is real. Which sort of, yeah, which sort of like, you know, gives you a sense that the the, the Mithraic religion is, is somehow fake or not real, especially, you know, in its institutional form on Earth but it is real here. And that's something, you know, sort of along the lines of what um, Lucius and Marcus say to each other earlier on. Um, Marcus says that, oh, you don't recognize your own religion if it's not dressed up in self-righteous bullshit. So Marcus is saying that, you know, the trappings and the the institutions and the costumes and, and some of the rituals around Mithraism are wrong. But there is like a heart and like a core of the religion that is real. And that and it is real because there is a real transmission and there is a real entity. Um, so, you know, yeah, why not have faith in it? Sure. Um, thanks for the super chat from Princess Linus who says, don't kink shame Marcus and Sue. Maybe, yeah, maybe that's the context of the punching. <laughs> Maybe what we're witnessing here with the uh, with the whole outfit and the uh, maybe this is a kink thing with them, but uh, yeah, punching. All right, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna yuck their yum. <laughs> uh, so Sue frees Marcus and they run off to fulfill the prophecy with Paul. And then there's this bit that we've already discussed about how you know mother and father discover that there's some extra function going on inside grandmother that is mysterious. And we don't know what that mysterious purpose is. Um, Something installed in her. Uh, And Sue and Paul try to open up the seed box, uh, but they can't cut it open. They need that lullaby that Sue sings later. And interestingly, the serpent, number seven, gets very agitated when this seed box starts opening. Uh, or maybe the snake is re- is reacting to Tempest's childbirth coming. I mean, it makes me think that this serpent has some kind of role, some kind of purpose, some kind of prophesied thing that the serpent is meant to do uh, to the seed or to Tempest's baby. Um, maybe the serpent was meant to take the seed into its body. Maybe the tree was meant to grow out of the serpent. And I mean, certainly the serpent has to have some kind of purpose relating to the tree of knowledge because, you know, the Garden of Eden Bible story, um, where it's the serpent who tells Adam and Eve to eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge. 
uh, although Marcus seems to require no such instruction and just immediately starts eating himself. Um, Lord Cycle says, who's the character you wish they would kill off? Um, well, I'm sad that Sue died. I, I feel like Lucius, like, feels like a bit of a loose end. Like, I, I would not be super upset if Lucius died. I mean, I like Lucius, but I don't know what he's adding to the story right now, necessarily. Um, mother and father are essential, I think. Campion and Paul are essential. Uh, I really like Tempest and Hunter and Holly and Vita. Uh, Cleaver... Uh, I, I I think Cleaver needs to do something, needs to find new purpose, but then maybe he could die. Um, I think Grandmother is interesting. Uh, yeah, there's not a there's not a lot of characters who I want cut from the show right now. So yeah, um, the the serpent is getting really agitated, and I'm not sure exactly why. Uh, Campion goes and checks on the serpent. And I love how Campion still has this connection to the serpent, but the serpent is really pissed off and it knocks Campion over and kind of hurts him. And so Mother goes and investigates. Um, and I like, you know, Mother's very protective of Campion and she sort of does this, you know, protective mama bear thing where she gets angry at the serpent. But then, like, the serpent is, you know, chastened and then Mother feels sorry and she says, oh, please don't cry. <laughs> Can the serpent actually cry? But yeah, like, I like how, you know, this is basically a baby, you know, like, this serpent is a big toddler, and, um, you don't want to be too mean to it, but at the same time, you got to be careful, because it is a uh, hundred times bigger than Campion, and it could hurt people, and it looks like it's getting bigger, too. I mean, this is very much like the dragons in Game of Thrones that get, like, imprisoned for a long time, and, you know, it's, it's, it's dangerous to let them free, but it feels wrong to have them in captive, um... So, yeah, really curious to see what this serpent does. I I think the serpent's got to break out and, like, go to the tree at some time soon. Um, the serpent's got to have some purpose in all of this, and I don't know what it is. Um, so, yeah, Sue and Paul fail to open up the box, so they have to do that later with the lullaby. Um, and so they prepare for Tempest having a baby, and Tempest sort of figures out how to evade um, how to evade mother and because she wants to go and kill her baby in the acid ocean instead of allowing the baby to be raised um, because, you know, it's, the baby was conceived by rape and Tempest doesn't want it. Um, and then, yeah, father has his conversation with grandmother that we discussed. You know, grandmother is sort of disoriented, like she has some purpose or some goal uh, with the rituals and, and the robots and the humans and um, she's she's disoriented in this in this different time that she's woken up in. I mean, how confusing would that be for grandmother? You know, she's been dead for thousands of years and now she's brought back into the world and no one who she knew is still around. I, I mean, grandmother is still very robotic so far, and I wonder to what extent grandmother will develop like a human-like personality in the show or if she's going to remain this sort of mysterious robotic sort of creature. Um, but yeah, Grandmother seems to want to do something to the humans on this planet, and Father starts going, oh, maybe, uh, oh, maybe this is, maybe this is a bad idea after all. Uh, Isaac in the live chat says, I don't think it's a good idea for the serpent to eat the fruit. I think it was made for it. Yeah, I mean, is this fruit for humans to eat, or is this fruit for serpents to eat? Or is this fruit for androids to eat? I, I, I mean, it, it seems to me as though, like, the flesh of this fruit is Sue's flesh. Um, seems kind of fucked up for humans to be eating human flesh. I, I mean, that although that was something that happened last season, because in season one, uh, the kids ate the creature meat, um, and then they found out that the creatures were devolved humans. So cannibalism has already been a theme in this show for a while. Um, thanks for the super chat from Phileo, who says that, uh, Sue evolved into Groot. Pretty much, pretty much. It also reminds me of, uh, Bob in Fallout 3, who, like, um, is a human who sort of grows into a tree person. Um, so, we, so, so, so Paul and Sue spring, uh, Marcus from prison, and in the same cell is Cleaver, and Cleaver looks... Very lost, having an existential crisis. He's lost his God, the trust. And, you know, as Mother said, like, he's been sort of 
broken. He sort of lost his identity. Like the trust replaced his identity. So like, who is he now? He says, I'm going back to Earth. Is he really going to go back to Earth? I, I, I doubt it. But like, what is his identity now? Like Cleaver is so lost and confused. And, um, and Marcus says, when the tree grows, eat from the tree and your mind will be healed. So, so that raises the question of like, what is the result of eating the fruit from the tree? Um, and, you know, I'll show you briefly the preview of the next episode. So, yeah, uh, if you don't want to see the preview of next episode, maybe look away for a sec. Um, but we see on the next episode, uh, people start eating the fruit. All these random atheists start eating this creepy flesh. Uh, I suppose Sue's flesh from this tree. So, like, you know, in the Bible, like, you know, eating from the tree of knowledge... Um, gave people knowledge of sin and it, like you know it 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 made people get kicked out of paradise in the garden of eden um it's original sin it's 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 disobeying god it's something for which humanity is punished so you know how's that going to play out in raised by wolves eating the fruit might be a terrible evil thing um, so Paul and Marcus and Sue go off on their family picnic to fulfill an ancient prophecy, and Marcus calls Paul Cocoon Boy, which is very cute. And again, like, it, 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 I, pff, Sue being back with Marcus seems so wrong to me, but whatever. Um, and Tempest goes off to give birth on her own amidst the crashing acid waves of the ocean on the rocks, and it's a very intense scene um and she says that i'm sorry to the baby but like i can't keep you she doesn't want the baby and it's very intense and emotional and she gives birth to the baby and then she kind of decides that she wants to keep it after all it seems i mean she doesn't say that but that's how it seems um i'm curious about whether this seaweed is acid proof like how can this seaweed grow in the acid water do you think maybe they could make clothes out of this acid proof seaweed and then they would be acid proof maybe that's how they will get uh tempest's baby back maybe they'll make like a, a a swimsuit out of acid proof seaweed and that's how they'll go and pursue tempest's baby that'd be cool uh grandmother versus mermaid says subarashi yeah yeah i mean i mean gr grandmother reacted to father saying that like there's a there's a baby being born uh, there's a new one on the way, and grandmother reacted to that. Maybe grandmother's purpose is to protect babies. So yeah, maybe maybe grandmother will go and fetch the baby back from the mermaid. Because yeah, the uh, the creature, which is you know a devolved uh, human creature, uh, snatches the baby from Tempest. And I felt like sort of the the choreography here was a bit silly. Um, because the because like. Tempest doesn't even try to, like, move away from the monster. The monster just steps up to her and just takes the baby out of her hands. And there's, like, no struggle or anything. I guess because of the acid, like, Tempest didn't feel able to fight back or whatever. And having just given birth, but, you know, whatever. Um, so, yeah, it's really fucked up that, like, just when Tempest starts to connect with this baby, after all this horror that she felt, uh, the baby is stolen from her. And yeah, like, why is this creature raising humans? I mean, I guess we can feel sorry for this mermaid creature because this mermaid creature is, like, um, descended from humans. Like, this creature is a devolved human creature, apparently. Uh, maybe it is just, like, doing what humans do. Like, maybe it thinks it, this is its baby. But interestingly, like, it puts the baby inside its chest cavity. Like, this creature seems to have, like, a pouch that is designed to, like, protect the baby and carry the baby and, I guess, protect the baby from the acid water. It's a very gross sort of a look. Um, but, like, you know, maybe these creatures were genetically engineered to, like, protect human babies and, like, to steal human babies and to nurture human babies. But, like, where does it go from here? Like, what... Is it going to grow into a human baby or a sea monster baby? I, pff, I got a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> Irked in the live chat says that Mother is an autocannon that some cyber furry slap hacked emotions onto. Yeah, it's uh, it, it was an interesting choice that Campion Sturge has made to turn a necromancer into a mother. 
weird choice for an atheist to make. Campion Sturges is still very mysterious. Uh, Icolm says, uh, who's going to feed the baby now? I, I think that the uh, sea creature is going to feed the baby. We, we saw that on the preview here. But uh, yeah, can babies drink acid mermaid milk? Uh, I guess we're going to find out. It's, it's also interesting, actually. It's interesting that when this mermaid came up, it looks like the mermaid came up from a hole at the bottom of the lake, like a pit. And like previously, like these pits, or at least some of these pits, they lead down to the planet core. And I think they were like a, a subway system for snakes to move around the planet. But if this creature came up from a pit, maybe this creature is coming from Sol. Maybe this creature is like an agent of God on the planet, you know? Maybe this creature is different to the other like devolved human creatures we've seen before. Maybe its purpose is different. I don't know. Uh, Hugh in the live chat says that maybe Campion Sturges heard the voice of Sol as well. He was a Mithraic before. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point because, um, because yeah, we, we Campion Sturges was a Mithraic person on Earth who rejected the Mithraic and became an atheist. So maybe he was sort of hearing a voice and he sort of rebelled from Mithraic orthodoxy, but, and, and like the Mithraic saw him as an atheist, but maybe Campion Sturges did not think of himself as an atheist. Maybe he thought of himself as just having a different, theological perspective than the other Mithraic, you know? He just had other beliefs. Uh, so yeah, Mother feels that she's failed to protect a child again. Like, we saw Mother's grief and pain at failing to protect her other children last season. Because, you know, Campion is the only survivor of the six original children that she raised on Kepler-22b. So, uh, that's a big blow to Mother. Um, and Mother realizes that Paul has run off with Marcus and Sue, so Mother's going to be very stressed and frustrated by uh, her failures, and she watches a quick YouTube recap of uh, Sue's storyline and realizes that Sue has, like, embraced religion, or at least has embraced um, Paul and Marcus, and so she asks Lucius where they are, and Lucius gives her the metal card, and yeah, like, I, I guess Mother is finding out right, right now that, you know, the tree kills humans to grow. I guess that's what Mother is learning. Uh, it's interesting that in this set here, there are more of these holes in the rocks, which, you know, I wonder, is that meant to be just a natural geological formation, or is that a little hole for little snake babies to crawl through? I don't know. There definitely are some pits and holes in the planet put there for uh, snaky reasons. But, uh, you know, there's a cute family dinner with Mother and with, with, with Marcus and Sue and Paul, and, you know, Sue is really enjoying having family and having love again. Despite all of their fucked up history, she's really happy. And so it's nice that she gets this moment of satisfaction before she gets turned into a fucking tree. I, maybe Sue will come back. I kind of want Sue to come back. Like, maybe her soul or her spirit or she'll grow from a pod or she'll climb up from a pit. Like, maybe Sue does exist still in some form. I would like her to... Because she gets duped. You know, like she wanted to be with her family, but she got tricked by God into becoming a tree. Like that is so rough. Like, like I want justice for Sue. Um, and so we're all praying for the same thing, Sue says. Like she's enjoying the togetherness that religion can give you, the sense of community. Uh, but unfortunately that shared purpose that they have is turning her into a tree. Um, and so, you know, Sue sings the lullaby, and it turns out that the, the, the lullaby is what opens the box. And it's interesting that, like, you know, this vision of, I mean, this moment of, like, Sue holding Paul is very similar to a vision that Marcus had a couple of episodes ago, where Marcus looked at Vril and Decima, but instead of seeing Vril and Decima, he saw Marcus and Sue. So I wonder if that was a vision sent by Sol, um that was sort of guiding Marcus towards reuniting with Sue and Paul in order to fulfill the prophecy. Though, again, as we keep saying, like, like the EMF field in the tropical zone is meant to block the signal. It's meant to stop Sol's voice from being heard. So, like, what is this voice that they're hearing? I think maybe, like, the snake or grandmother might be allowing Sol to 
communicate despite the EMF field. Maybe that's what's going on, but very mysterious. Um, and the fact that this box opens to Mithraic lullabies sort of shows how like the scripture and the religion of Mithra of Mithraicism, you know, it's not just a religion, it is an instruction manual on how to fulfill the prophecies, you know, like this isn't just a religion, this is an ancient set of instructions sent by some entity or signal in order to make humans do a certain thing on this planet. Um, and that might involve, you know, that involves birthing serpents, that involves growing trees. It might not be in hum humanity's best interests, the fulfillment of this prophecy. Although the promise is that, you know, the Chosen One will make a paradise city. So, you know, we'll see if that actually works out for them. Um, and so I really like that, you know, Sue's really excited. She's going to get to grow the, the, the seed. But as soon as she grabs the seed, the seed like melts into her body. I guess this is another kind of like biotech. And it like goes inside her and like takes over her body. Like it like takes over her brain. And so she like feverishly, like mindlessly, like a zombie, she is compelled to start like digging in the dirt and to like plant her arms. It's, it's, it's a great performance and it's very disturbing. Like it, her body's being controlled by this seed and she starts digging. Um, uh, in order to plant the tree. And, and it reminds me of, like, in the real world, in nature, like, there are parasites that lay their eggs inside other creatures. Um, and there are... I think I think it's a kind of, like, fungus that infects ants, and then it takes over the ant's brain, and it, like, forces the ant to go to a particular place and do a certain thing so that the parasite can be birthed from the corpse of the ant. Like, this is what's going on here, I think. You know, it's this, like, parasitism for reproduction. Um, it's, 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 one of those, uh, it's one of those arguments for uh, the, uh, the problem of evil and the question of, like, you know, like, there are some organisms in nature that are so fucked up that it's like, how could there possibly be a god, a benevolent god, creating these organisms? Because it is so fucked up that there are entire life cycles, there are entire creatures that the only way they can exist and reproduce on this earth is by laying their eggs inside others, taking over their brains, forcing them to turn into zombies and have chest bursters grow from their body like xenomorphs. Like, there are some incredibly fucked up things in nature. Um, and I, I, I imagine that's what sort of inspired what's happening to Sue. And so, yeah, it, it, just, it just sucks that this is Sue's last moments, you know? She is exploited. Like, she wanted a family, but she was manipulated by God into becoming a tree. And I, I just, it hurts, you know? It's so sad. It's fucked up. Uh, but, you know, again, it does sort of fit the themes of, you know, sacrifice and death being required for life, you know? Um, I, and I like these shots of, like, the mist above Kepler 22b, because the mist sort of makes me think of the entity or the god. I mean, you know, God lives in the clouds is what a lot of, you know, cultures believe and religions believe in, in some sense. And so when I see these shots of, of the clouds and the fog, I, it sort of makes me think that is perhaps what the entity or the god exists in. And so Paul's all excited that the tree has been grown and the prophecy is fulfilled, yay. Uh, but then Marcus sort of begins to understand that, oh, like, this is what happened to Sue. And I really like the way that they did this. Because, you know, Paul is, like, shouting, Mom, Mom, trying to look for Sue in the background, while Marcus sort of examines the tree. And, you know, you can see the grief in his eyes and you can see the understanding in his eyes when he starts to realize, like, oh my god, like, Sue is inside the tree, and he hears the heartbeat inside the tree. So I guess all of Sue's body parts have provided the nutrients and the anatomy and the biomass for the tree. This is a tree with, like, human DNA, which makes you wonder about every other tree on this planet. Is it possible that, like, all the trees, like, in some sense, grew from human biomatter or human souls, as Campion suggested in Season 1? Um, and yeah, what will the effect of this strange fruit be, this human fruit on this tree? Um, and, you know, uh, is this, is this, is the eating of this fruit going to imbue people with, like, faith and, like, belief in the plan of this god? Is the, is this parasitic, exploitative tree organism going to continue to infect and control and influence humans through the consumption of this fruit? 
Is it going to be like a brain disease? Is religion not an infectious mimetic brain disease? Lots of interesting thoughts that we can raise here. So we're going to wrap up this live stream shortly. If there's any burning questions or other points or things that I've missed or other stuff that you want to discuss, chuck it in the live chat now. Uh, thank you so much for participating. Do like and comment and subscribe if you'd like to see more. And uh, we'll be back here next week to talk about Season 2, Episode 7. Uh, what's going on in the chat? Um, Ms. T says, Sue will become <laughs> the parent to the new human race. She will get a family. Oh my god, yeah, maybe you're right. Like, maybe Sue, by becoming this tree, like, will become, like, the mother and, like, the provider of nutrients and the guide and, like, the holy center to this planet. Like, maybe this does give Sue some kind of beautiful purpose, in a sense. But, like, she did not choose this, you know? She did not want this, and so, you know. I wonder if they might still be able to communicate with Sue. Like, if her heartbeat is still inside the tree, if her soul is still inside the tree, like, maybe Sue's voice will be able to speak to people. I mean, that's kind of what the old gods are in A Song of Ice and Fire. Like, the old gods are the souls of the dead inside the trees, and the old gods seem to be basically the hive personification of all the dead of A Song of Ice and Fire. So, you know... Maybe Sue will continue to have some kind of influence. Um, hopefully, um, hopefully Paul will not eat his mother. Um, Ms. T says, will Marcus and Paul be affected by the fruit differently to others? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I mean, certainly generally, like, Paul and Marcus as the chosen ones or whatever, you know, may react to this stuff differently. And, like, Paul reacted to the bioweapon differently to other people. So, yeah, maybe. Um, Randy says, Shy might be able to talk to the snake now. Yeah, maybe eating the fruit allows you to communicate with the snake. I mean, I, I think eating the fruit should give people some kind of terrible knowledge. Like, Adam and Eve in the Bible ate the fruit, and then they realized they were naked, and they suddenly had shame. And it's about, like, growing up and discovering sex and, like, losing your childlike naivety. So I think there should be some kind of discovery or revelation as a result of eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Um, Subarashi says, David still out in the universe. Uh, Matt says, will grandmother's botanotech revive the remains of the trust? Ooh, that's an interesting idea. Because, yeah, like the trust does seem to be an organic computer. So maybe in the same way that grandmother was revived, maybe the trust could also be revived. Um... Daniel says, why is Marcus still devoted to Sol? He knows he's not the chosen one because of the eyes. It turns Sue into a tree. He knows that it's a literal entity. Yeah, I mean, Marcus... I mean, Marcus, like, you know, some people in the real world, um, he has faith no matter what, you know? No matter how much evidence there is against his beliefs, he will continue to believe in them. Like, like that is the definition of faith, and Marcus has it. Um... And I think part of the reason why Marcus has such strong faith is that he has nothing else. And, like, the source of identity and the source of power and the source of emotional security for him and the source of his bond with Paul, like, everything that he values comes from his faith and his belief that he is the prophet of Sol. So, yeah, I don't expect Marcus to lose faith anytime soon. Um, Princess Lioness, thanks for the super chat, says, What importance do you think Tempest's baby will play? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I, I, I'm really interested to see what happens with, you know, the baby being raised by mermaids. I'm curious why the baby is acid-proof. Um, and, like, this is the first human baby born on this planet, you know? I mean, apart from, like, Campion and the others who were, like, raised from embryos by mother, like, this is the first, like, naturally conceived human on the planet. So, like, I... I, you know, I could imagine this baby being the chosen one or the prophesied one, the one who will fulfill the prophecies and stuff. Um, I could imagine this baby having a serious, like, prophetic, mystical, messianic role. Um, but the whole sort of mermaid abduction is certainly an unexpected complication. <laughs> uh, Dawn says, Marcus is still an orphan. He needs something to fill a gap he's likely always had. Yeah. Yeah, I think Marcus was psychologically damaged and had unfulfilled psychological needs, and he has found a lot of fulfillment in this religion. Um, 
Marcus just wants what gives him power, says Beatness. Uh, <laughs> Ryan says, raised by merwolves. Yeah, that's what they should change the name of the show to. Uh, Five Gingers says that the fruit looks like a brain because brains give knowledge. Yeah, that's a good point. I agree. It does look like a brain. And I guess a, uh, a, a tree of knowledge should be a brain tree in a brain forest. Uh, with brain fruit. Uh, that that does make perfect sense. Uh, I mean, the Bible doesn't say that the tree of knowledge is an apple tree. Maybe it was a brain tree all along. Uh, Big Pizza Plaza says, Pagnostic describes someone who believes in natural deities and that everything has a spirit. Pagan slash agnostic. Paul is Romulus. Campion is Remus. Campion Sturges is an anagram for... Pagnostic Remus. Is it really? <laughs> Campion Sturges is an anagram for Pagnostic Remus. I doubt that's deliberate, but I do like it. That is cool. Um, Cobra in the live chat says that Yahweh in the garden isn't the real god, just a lesser god that created the system. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's all sorts of uh, skullduggery going on if you study uh, Genesis and some of the original texts. I'll shout out, there's a podcast called A, a Podcast of Biblical Proportions. Uh, it's, it's one of the two people in the uh, Game of Thrones Academy YouTube channel uh, who do some really great Song of Ice and Fire analysis. And it's one of those people and another person doing uh, a discussion of the Bible. Uh, chapter by chapter and uh, they take the perspective of um, like they are both uh, Israeli guys who have like a lot of knowledge about uh, Judaism and they have knowledge of like the original biblical texts in Hebrew and they take a sort of irre irreverent and sort of naturalistic and sort of atheistic uh, perspective but also like a like just like a fun and a respectful one and a thoughtful one and I um, I recommend a podcast of biblical proportions if you'd like to listen to a, a fun and informative discussion of the bible which is obviously very re very relevant to raised by wolves um yeah uh i think we will end it there oh thank you for the donation from vichy swas who says, thanks for being someone else who matches my love of discussing heady philosophical concepts while watching TV. Love you, Shrifty. Thank you, Vichy Swas. All right. Um, we're going to end it up. I mean, another question is what's going to happen with Vril, because Vril appears in um, the on the next episode thing as well. So uh, will Vril still be a murderous Terminator? I, I, I wonder if Campion might be able to reconnect with Vril and sort of help Vril chill the fuck out and stop murdering people. That could be important. Um, Red Cross in the live chat says that Otho's helmet uh, could be made from a metal that blocks Sol's signal. And maybe the punishment atheist helmet does the same thing. Yeah, because Otho is the rapist father of Tempest's baby. And Otho complained that uh, he heard the voice of Sol that supposedly instructed him to rape Tempest, but then he stopped hearing Sol at some point. Maybe the reason he stopped hearing Sol was because this helmet was blocking out the signal like a tinfoil hat. Maybe, and maybe the punishment helmet that the atheists use, this one, also blocks out the signal. Maybe. Um, all right, we're going to end it now. Uh, thanks for joining in, everybody. Uh, thanks for participating. Thank you for thank you very much to everyone who uh, donated and gave super chats. And uh, we'll see you next week. Cheers. <laughs>